Well, good afternoon and welcome to our event this uh, today talking about mapping the road to a better future of work, care, and well-being. I'm Bridget Schulte. I'm the director of the Better Life Lab at New America. We're the work family justice uh, program looking at how we elevate the value of care, how work needs to change so that it can support our lives and have time for care, uh, elevating that value, um, how public policy needs to change, business practice needs to change, and our own cultural expectations need to change so that we can all combine work and care across the arc of our lives in ways that are meaningful to us. Uh, I'm joined also by my co-host, Molly Martin. She's the Director of Strategy here at New America. And we're excited to, uh, to have you all here with us. We'll be giving you a brief introduction about the, this, how this is part of a much larger project, trying to understand where we are now and the current reality uh, and what some, some possible futures might be and how we get to a better one. Um, Molly will be sharing uh, some of our findings uh, and then we'll have a, a fireside chat uh, that's been pre-recorded uh, with a policymaker, and then a very, hopefully, very robust discussion with a panel of uh, workers, business leaders, um, researchers, and advocates. Uh, uh, very much, very reflective of what we have uh, shared in the podcast and the virtual convening that we had last spring. And then we definitely want to have your questions and comments. So we've, we've allotted quite a bit of time for questions, comments, and discussion. We began this project uh, really looking at um, sort of the intersection of work stress and future of work trends. And at the time, there is not a whole lot of discussion about sort of the reality of work stress, if you will. Uh, a lot of times we tend to think of uh, uh, like work issues or uh, when we think of work and health, it's, you know, are you going into a coal mine or, you know, uh, we think about OSHA, what they regulate. And yet there's a growing body of really compelling research pre-COVID, during COVID that's also coming out about uh, psychosocial stress, stress itself, sort of this disconnect between uh, job rewards and job demands that are becoming more and more disconnected, that are creating more and more stress, that affect people both in the moment acutely through heart attacks or strokes in the moment, or, or can accumulate over time and lead to chronic ill health and ill well-being. So we were looking at, well, where is that going to go in the future? Uh, and then really thinking about the human element in the future of work. A lot of the conversation is around AI and technology and robots. And, and we really wanted to understand the human element of, uh, of not only work stress, but these future of work trends. And really ask the question, how do we design a better and equitable future? So let's start with, um, let's see if I can move this forward. You know, we started thinking really, really big. What's the vision? Where are we going here? How do we get to, say, a good life uh, where there's time, where work is sustaining, uh, it supports human life? Um, and if there's not enough work to go around, there are uh, mechanisms. We have uh, safety nets that work, that help spiral people up rather than uh, have people fall through the cracks. Uh, how can we have uh, time, not just for our lives, but for care, for leisure, for joy. And how do we make that equitable uh, so that it's not just, so it's not another marker of inequality uh, where only those with uh, the most resources have time and everyone else lives in time scarcity or time poverty. Uh, so how do we get to this, this, this better future? And we really started asking sort of thinking big, and thinking about, well, who needs, to, what are the roles? How do we get from here to there? And who plays what role? And we also started to think like, well, what if we don't do anything? And what if we stay on the current trajectory? And where could we go? And we're already at a state of really unprecedented inequality. And I called this vision, the sort of second more dystopian vision, kind of a Blade Runner. You know, what happens if we don't intervene, if we don't play roles? Uh, if policymakers don't get involved, uh, if business leaders don't do anything differently, if workers don't don't change, or if advocates, um, you know, if, if we continue on the current trajectory, uh, and so this was sort of a, a cautionary tale, and how do we move from here to a better future and avoid Blade Runner? 
So let's start a little bit with where we are with current reality uh, before we can, so this is hopefully setting the stage for this conversation and for understanding sort of what's really at stake here. Uh, just as uh, with work stress, it's inequality sort of, and power that leads to more and more work stress. Um, current reality, the, uh, you know, those are the same forces when we think about future of work trends and where human beings fit. It's, it's still about uh, inequality and power and who has it. So let's look just at work stress. Um, I've mentioned some of the, the literature that uh, there was one uh, meta-analysis of more than 200 work stress and health uh, studies that had been done over time. And what they found is that the way we work, simply the way we work right now, this is before COVID with work-life conflict, long work hours, sometimes toxic cultures where you don't feel psychologically safe, uh, many essential workers have unpredictable schedules. Maybe they don't even know how many hours they'll get, which leads to income volatility as well as time volatility. There's been growing job insecurity as we have more contract and independent and gig workers. Uh, so there's more precarity. And even in uh, sort of the so-called best jobs, there, you know, there is growing anxiety. There's research that shows growing anxiety because you don't know how long that job might last. Um, we have come to rely on um, laying people off as, has become sort of a business model for, you know, in many cases. And that leads to incredible stress and elevated suicide rates as well. So uh, this is one of the things that we explored in a uh, 10 episode podcast season that we aired with our partners in Slate uh, in the last couple months where we really dove deeply into work stress and these future work trends. And the research shows that the way we work, just simply the way we work now leads to so much stress, it's actually the fifth leading cause of death. And this is before COVID. Um, and so let's look at, at really what's been happening sort of in this larger macro picture. And you can see uh, this is research done by um, wonderful um, researchers at the Economic Policy Institute and, and others have done this as well, where they've looked at rising productivity. And for so many decades, particularly after the Second World War, worker wages worked in lockstep with productivity. And then you see in about the 1980s that started to shift. And so more and more of the fruits of that labor is, you know, even though productivity continued to, to, to rise, the workers did not share in the fruits of that labor. So much more of that prosperity, you know, became this sort of growing unequal trend, whereas the fruits of the labor went to the owners or the capital, if you will. Um, and so that's, uh, this is key. Um, how did this happen? How do we, how do we address this? Um, you know, if technology and automation continues to make productivity uh, rise, efficiency rise, who's going to benefit from that? Will it be the, the owners of the machines? And then that's a very small pool. And what about the rest of us? That's, you know, this, if we continue on this trajectory, that could very well lead us to more of a Blade Runner scenario. You know, at the same time, um, again, growing with this growing inequality trend, um, uh, CEO compensation has really, uh, you know, has been part of this widening gap between what workers earn and what CEOs earn. It's been um, really widening in, in recent decades. Uh, and this is a really important, uh, important thought that we really, that came out in the podcast and it came out in a virtual convening that we held, um, which is, you know, if we leave it all to the market, um, as we have in the past, you know, after the Second World War, the market created a lot of really great jobs, manufacturing jobs that began to change in the 70s and 80s with free trade agreements, with changing the changing economy, with jobs moving overseas. And so now what the market is is creating, this is according to um, a really wonderful report that MIT put together looking at the work of the future. It's sort of uh, the way that uh, David Otter, the MIT economist has described it as sort of like a, a barbell weighted on either end. We're, we're having, uh, the market is creating this bifurcated workplace, workforce where we have the creation of high paying uh, knowledge and technical jobs and low paying um, service jobs. And what's, what we're not creating are those middle-class medium, sort of medium pay jobs that, it, that we have it, when we've gone through uh, past sort of industrial cycles or industrial revolutions. So we've, we're going to have 
you know, high, you know, really great jobs and really potentially really crummy jobs. So then the question becomes, what do we do about those crummy jobs? Do we just accept that they're crummy and then we create uh, safety nets around them? Or do we make those jobs better jobs? And so I'm really excited in the panel, we're going to have some panelists speak directly to how we, how we ensure good jobs and why that's so important. Um, you know, thinking again along the, the lines of kind of crummy jobs, if you look at, you know, just where a lot of our um, low skill, which is a, another a misnomer, and that's something that we'll be talking about in the panel, but sort of low paid jobs in the United States, the service jobs that are being created on that lower end of the spectrum, um, they're actually worse here than in other, uh, in other advanced economies. And you know, why is that? And who's responsible for that? And how do we change that? And so this is in part policymakers and, uh, you know, the public sector looking at minimum wage. This is businesses looking at um, how we think about workers and how we value them and how we invest in them. Um, and then when we look about at COVID, sort of the brave new world of COVID coming down and just really disrupting so much of work and care in, in recent years, uh, you can see the real brunt of uh, like who's, you know, we talked about the, the C, uh, she session and who lost jobs, who's, who has really um, borne so much of the pain of the, uh, of, of the COVID disruptions. And you can see it's, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's people with caregiving responsibilities. It's mothers more so than fathers. And when you look, it's, it's really mothers of color who have uh, born most of the, um, of the disruption of, of COVID, um, losing jobs. Uh, and the, uh, some of these uh, service jobs uh, that are being created, care jobs are among the fastest growing jobs. This is also where women of color are over, overrepresented. Uh, so there's already, COVID has just made an, uh, an unequal landscape even more unequal. And we talk about, um, you know, essential workers, but then, you know, other than clapping for them and maybe giving a few, uh, you know, uh, temporary wage increases, if you look at, uh, you know, who, who's been most impacted by COVID, who's died from COVID, in every instance, every age group, every um, uh, uh, racial and ethnic de demographic, it's essential workers who have borne more of, you know, not only because they had to go to work, the deskless workers, if you will, um, they have borne much more of the, uh, borne much more of the health and uh, illness burden of COVID. Um, and another thing that really has come up in the podcast and the convening and in this project is that we've really got a broken social contract between workers and business and government. And in the, in the last several decades, workers are more and more increasingly on their own. Um, when we just look at public policy, we are uh, literally one of the few countries uh, in the entire world, developed, uh, advanced or not, that does not have, does not guarantee paid maternity leave or paid parental leave, paid family leave. Uh, we're one of the few that does not guarantee paid sick days. We had some emergency paid sick days during the pandemic. Uh, but that also exempted some of the largest employers where most of the essential workers worked. So uh, that was also, uh, that also led to illness and death. So we don't have a guarantee of paid sick days. We don't have a guarantee of, of paid vacation or paid time off to recover. Um, in the United States, uh, including healthcare, all of this is left to employers, which is one of the reasons why jobs are so expensive. It's another reason why it's very difficult to get enough hours because if it's expensive, it's you know it's easier to have a contract worker rather than a full job with full benefits. So there's interesting conversations going on about how do we make benefits portable? Uh, how do we make them public and equitable and universal? Uh, because if we leave it, the research shows if we leave it to businesses uh, to, pr to provide all of these benefits on their own, um, who tends to get the benefits are those high wage uh, knowledge job, knowledge workers who, um, you know, then that's seen as a race for talent and who does not get these benefits are the essential workers, the service workers, 
who could use them the most. Uh, and we also, when it comes to childcare, I think it was so clear during the pandemic uh, about how broken that system is. You can see that the United States spends about the, among the least of all of the advanced economies on what it invests in creating childcare system. Um, we also rely a lot on unemployment, and yet uh, you know the layoffs um, uh, sort of become a business model, and yet. Um, uh, it's really unfair. Uh, many in many states, um, just a handful of workers might actually qualify for them, and in many cases, the benefits uh, don't last long. We did have emergency pandemic insurance, and we'll be talking about that during the the panel. And we learned a lot of good lessons about when it lasts enough time, when the the benefit is enough to help you survive, so that you can find the next better job rather than just take the next thing that comes along to try to survive, that there are some real benefits to that. Uh, so that really just leads us to, to the, the larger question, this, this, the future of work and well-being. You know, how do we make space for humans in this automation? And the real question that we really struggled with is, you know, as we think about that, that bifurcated workforce, um, you know, what we know from the past, and again, this is work that MIT has done, that technology and automation will destroy jobs. You know, there's no question about it, but there will be new jobs that will be invented, jobs that we haven't even imagined. And the real question will be, will these new jobs be good enough? Will they be big enough to support human life? And if they're not, what are we going to do about that? How do we make them better jobs? How do we support? Uh, how do we support people if we're going to accept that they're not better jobs? If there isn't enough work to go around, then what? So these were all the questions that we that we grappled with. And one of the things that really has stuck with me is when, um, again, the MIT economist David Otter said, "If we accept that sort of growing bifurcation, what we might end up with in this Blade Runner reality is a, a society of the servers." and the served, and uh, where that inequality would become a, a permanent fixture. And that has enormous implications for our society, for our economy, for our sense of uh, fairness, uh, and for our democracy. So these are some of the questions that we grappled with. And uh, we really came down to sort of two big takeaways, and that is the future is a choice. It's not set in stone, and that we all have a role to play policymakers, business leaders, researchers, workers, advocates, we all have a role to play in creating that better future. Uh, and so with this, I would love to turn it over to my uh, co-facilitator, Molly Martin, the Director of Strategy at New America to take us through some of the findings. Thank you so much, Bridget. Uh, my name is Molly Martin, as Bridget said, I'm the Director of Strategy at New America, but also someone with a a keen interest in how we work, how we talk about work, and how we treat working people and how we treat ourselves. What Bridget said, obviously, is true. Expertise is lived, the future is a choice, and there's a role for all of us. And these kind of mantras guided us in the project that you'll see linked in the lower corner of your screen, um, mapping, a, mapping the road to a better future of work and well-being. Bridget has been doing interviews for quite a while and working on the podcast, talking to folks from economists to home care workers, to Lyft drivers, to attorneys, to policymakers and activists. And she's done it with the purpose of learning about what each of these different quote walks of life thinks and believes about work. We all know work has honor. Uh, most of us kind of accept the practical truth of capitalism. We, we probably will be working or earning at some point in our life. But I think we all believe that our worth does not come from work. Our worth comes from our, our life. Our, our role is just a plain human. And we thought you can't have a conversation about improving the balance between humanity and work without talking to some real humans. And that's where the lived experience comes in. And so what we did is we convened a group of people who work in all ways and have all manner of experience with working in America. And we asked them, what do you think think needs to happen so that we get away from this intense, unhealthy pressure that Bridget talked about. And so we get away from this 
this huge gap between people who left the house every day during COVID and people who didn't, but also understand the stressors of folks who wear lab coats to work and folks who wear work boots. And we all share in common the fact that in America, for many of us, work is killing us. And so we thought the only people who know how to get around it are the people working every day. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to spin through a couple things that Bridget mentioned, but also a couple things that you'll find in the paper that Bridget, Angela Spitalette, and I co-authored, and that you'll find again linked in the bottom of your screen. Uh, what drives work stress? You heard Bridget mention some of these, but I think it's important to note one of these in particular. Some of these aren't a surprise to you, but the no justice or fairness culture at work. We asked a lot of people again and again, what makes you get up in the morning? What inspires you? And while money is a reality, and good wages are important and increasing wages is really important. People said the way I'm treated, the value I believe that I add. And when there's not justice, when I'm not valued as a human being, when there's racial, ethnic, gender disparity, uh, when there's racism, sexism, when people don't understand my gender identity or my culture, it really takes away from my work experience, but it takes little bites out of me as a person. And so I would say the justice culture is driving work stress probably as much as any of the things on this list. Next slide, please. So what do we want people to do? Uh, there are lots of different roles to play. There are lots of different players. One of them, obviously, businesses and employers. And for businesses, you'll see this as a common thread throughout the, the highlights here. We want to change the narrative, reframe the idea that what you produce is what matters. Sure, productivity matters. It's a business reality. But the investment in human capital drives that productivity. Even as automation increases, the different jobs that support automation, inform automation, create automation, are there when the automation fails. These actually continue to matter, besides the fact that we haven't yet found like an automated daycare worker that anybody's super keen to give their kids to. We still need people. And those people are the heart and can be a real asset to your business. And so one of the things that businesses can do is rethink their accounting practices and the way they talk about workers. It's not about formula. It's about the people who show up every day to help you live your life or make your product. Next slide, please. Similarly, this is also about narrative. We need to change the way we talk about workers and make it human-centered. We talked about the humane treatment being at the center of a better future of work. We also need to change things like the jobs report, uh, how we report on work. That jobs report about how many jobs we created last month, certainly that's one important data point. But it matters more that those jobs aren't terrible jobs. It matters more what those jobs can pay folks to do. While there's honor in all work, if we are creating 8 million jobs in one corner and they're not paying folks enough to live a good life, support their family, take time off when they need it, have we really created something that's in the interest of the economy or the American community we all want to live in? Next slide, please. What can researchers do? There are lots, but one really interesting idea that came from another New America colleague was we need to collect the caregiver status of employees, uh, not to target them, not to punish them, but to support them. We do not have a good sense in this country of the different caregiving roles that people are expected to play every day. We understand perhaps more about parenthood, but you might be caring for an elder parent, a partner, a pet, your community, yourself. And we don't really have a good way of collecting and keeping data in a consistent manner to understand the different demands on people's time. So this was one great idea from a colleague. Next slide, please. What can tech policy leaders do? Technology matters here, automation matters. And we know that as people try to increase productivity, technology is just around the corner, monitoring, surveilling. And these aren't always impacting our productivity. They're often detrimental to our well being, but we don't have all the information. So it would be worth finding out. What does the omnipresence of technology mean uh, for everyone from a home healthcare worker to a technologist who's working on the Google campus? Next slide, please. And what can policymakers and policy leaders do? Accounting practices and tax policy are only so much in our control here at the ground level. And we'd really encourage people to think about human capital as assets. Those are assets and not liabilities. They're not just expenses hitting your bottom line. They are the reason that you can continue to thrive and grow. And it's your investment in a better future. It's the moral and ethical thing to do, but it's also smart economics. Now, 
Uh, next slide, please. You'll notice as I point you to, to learn more, these are just a couple snippets of some of the things we heard from the people who would know best, the people living it. So I hope you'll check out the report. You'll notice I didn't list what can workers do. There is absolutely a role for workers, uh, certainly to think critically about what's going on in your own environment, speak transparently about what you're paying. Um, be open to hearing new ideas for organizing or changing the way you work. But one of the things that we heard again and again in doing this work is this is a systems problem. And we often put the onus on workers, change the system you're in. And that's a really big ask and largely unfair. But as individual people, we interact every day with people who work. We can honor them, respect them, talk to them, look them in the eye, advocate for them that they're paid fairly. Uh, if you have someone who takes care of your home, maybe you could contribute to a paid leave bank for that person. So think critically about the way that you engage with everyone in your life. We're all out there working on something. On that note, before I hand it back to Bridget, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of people are working to make this event happen. Uh, and we don't want invisible, unseen work happening. So thank you to Angela, who is running the event for us. Thank you to Jason Stewart, who does our AV production. And thank you to Riley Rogerson, who is our events associate. Uh, on that, Bridget, I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you so much, Molly. That was wonderful. And yes, thank you so much to all of the all of the all the people behind the scenes who are maybe invisible to to the participants, but really integral, really essential to to all of this all of this work. So, what we'd like to do now is we'll we'll play a re pre recorded fireside chat. Um, we wanted to we invited lawmakers from both sides of the aisle to speak with us today, and we're so glad that Representative Jim Himes, a Democrat of Connecticut, was able to join us. Um, Representative Himes, he is the chair of the House Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. And he's been thinking quite a bit about these, these uh, visions and these futures and how we get to a, a better future of work and well being. So let's listen. Well, hello. We're so grateful to have you with us. We've got uh, Representative Jim Himes, a Democrat of Connecticut, and he's the chair of the House Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. So, uh, Congressman, you were on our podcast. We were talking a lot about the future of work and well-being. And let's start with the big picture. So much of what we talk about, we get into the nitty gritty, we get into the details. But what's the vision? What's that North Star? Where should we think about going? You know, it's a great question, Bridget, and, and it was sort of one of the early questions of, of the committee, right, which is, what, what's your endpoint? What is, what is your endpoint? And, and if you want to stay in the policy realm and if you want to sort of stay out of the field of philosophy, you know, what you what you do is you arrive at the point of view that we have such a long way to go uh, to a world where an individual's prosperity, their location on the income ladder is related purely to the extent to which they've invested themselves in themselves and worked hard. Um, that there's a lot to do there. Now, the reason I say we're not getting into philosophy is that, you know, Professor Michael Sandel has a criticism of the meritocratic structure, but that's, that's philosophy. That's not where we are. We, we have so much to do to yank out the arbitrary factors associated with prosperity, skin color, gender, geographic location, um, that we don't need to get into that, but we do grapple really hard with how can we you know, quickly, because, you know, uh, we have become so disparate in our economic outcomes. How can we quickly make a difference here? So how can we? So how <laughs> do we how do we get to that better future of work and well-being? And I, I love that, that you're talking about these sort of arbitrary factors that now play such an enormous role in uh, somebody, someone's work and quality of life and are projected to play potentially enormous roles, gender, skin color, where you live, uh, your, your, your background, what's your sort of economic, kind of what your parents did. Um, all of that is really deterministic right now. And exactly, could, yeah. could be in the future. How do you get beyond that? What are some of those things that get Well, there's, there's so much that can be said on this. And we're in the process of writing what will be a lengthy report on all of the things that you can do. And I mean, it's everything from considering things like a national minimum wage, which of course hasn't gone up in an awful lot of places to considering the fact that our tax code sends an awful lot of government uh, uh, largesse to people who are doing pretty darn well. The, the bit that's to me most exciting though, because at the end of the day, our society puts such primacy on you know, what Joe Biden says, the dignity of the individual, uh, that 
What's most exciting, of course, is the question of how can we really disrupt the systems that we have, education and training, to invest in people. And even that's a big topic, right? I mean, you know, if you were to look at the federal budget, a huge slice of the pie, not quite half, but a huge slice of the pie goes to uh, our senior citizens, people over the age of 65 via Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. The amount that we invest in our youngest uh, community members, prenatal through five years old, is infinitesimal. And if a Martian landed on our, on our planet, said, "What? They, you know, they'd say, what in the world are you doing?'" And you know, you obviously have to have that conversation without you know, uh, you know, pitting demographic groups against each other. But that's just madness, right? And another area of madness that I think we should ch- change pretty quickly is that you know we still have education and training systems that are set up for a world that is long gone. You know, both my daughters had this summer off so that they could help bring in the crops, right? I mean, it's madness, <laughs> right? Um, and you know, shame on us, by the way. And by us, I don't just mean the government, but you know, we've we've forever maintained this notion that you know, the be all end all is to go to college, right? And so we built mm-hmm. all of these massive government support structures like Pell Grants, like uh, student loans, a topic of much conversation lately, that, that, that is designed to send you to college, which only 40-ish percent of Americans do. We've almost got nothing for that, you know, kid out there who's really interested in getting a certificate, uh, being an electrician. So anyway, my point is we've got a lot of disruption we can do to a system which is no longer addressing the economic needs of our time. So I'm hearing raising the minimum wage. I'm hearing addressing tax code. I think one of the things that we talked about is the tax code also, it favors, you're going to invest in machinery or, uh, you know, uh, sort of technology, you get a much greater return on your investment than if you, than if you invest in people or in human capital, that that's something the tax code could address. Um, Well, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, when you have a tax code that heavily taxes labor, but much less heavily taxes capital, it should be no surprise that you can walk into a McDonald's today and interact with the machine and not see very many people. Now, that's not an argument against technology. It's just mm -hmm. an argument like technology is inevitable, but it is an argument for not putting your finger on the scale in a way that damages the ability of people to get compensated for their labor. You know, so you talked about education and training and putting the finger on the scale. One of the things, again, that has really struck me in so much of the reporting that we've been doing in the podcast and the convening is really the central question of the future of work is not so much technology is a given. Automation is coming. There's just no way to stop that. And technology can drive innovation. And that's a good thing. And we want that. The idea that technology can make our lives better is a very exciting uh, possibility. But the central question is there's no doubt that technology is going to destroy certain jobs. It will create other jobs. And the real question is, will these new jobs be enough to sustain human life? And if you look at the trajectory where, we're, where we are, where we've been the past 40 or 50 years, you know, we've had lots of good middle class jobs destroyed and going overseas, manufacturing and, uh, and other sort of good life, you know, sort of family supportive uh, jobs. They've, they're gone. They're replaced with service sector jobs, low paid jobs, uh, contract, insecure gig jobs. And I guess that's the real question. Is there, does the government, does public policy put its finger on the scale to help ensure that whatever those new jobs are uh, break from this current trajectory of sort of really great high, high paying jobs and really crummy low paying jobs and kind of nothing in the middle? Yeah, yeah, no, what a what a topic. And once again, the answer is, of course, we're doing this wrong, right? You know, more and more, you talked about gig jobs. Um, you know, gig jobs don't come with benefits. Uh, often they don't come with health care, retirement plans, et cetera. Um, you know, I, it, maybe this is an argument made by folks on the left, but I would hope it would have some appeal on the right too, which is that if we're entering an economy where more people are, use, are, are taking gig jobs because they are between jobs, they want to supplement their income, or the world that my daughters live in and not the world that my parents lived in, where you're going to have you know, six or seven jobs in a period of 12 years. You know, maybe we need to think more seriously about the model that says that you know, your health insurance, your retirement, your disability insurance is going to come through your employer. Now, you know, I'm not going to try I, I, the, the Republican immediately is saying, well, you're just looking to expand government. Well, maybe, maybe not. But the point is, can we have a more efficient system? Because our system today um, is not very efficient. And, and so, yeah, 
yeah, I mean, we, we, we really need to be thinking this through because, uh, you know, technology, as you point out, is not going away. And I even worry, you know, I'm deeply suspicious of arguments that everything is different now because almost, ne- you know, that's almost never true. Um, and, and, you know, the, and I'm a huge fan, I think, like you of technology, and you're absolutely right. It destroys legacy businesses. But, you know, the story has always been that more jobs get created because of technology. And that story has always been true. But something feels a little different to me in this world of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I worry that more and more human jobs are going to be replaced by computers. Uh, And it's not just, you know, it's not just the guy on the factory floor anymore. It's radiologists, it's accountants, it's, it's, you know, vast swaths of our, of our economy, including very high paying jobs are going to get taken out by machines. And what people say, and I agree with this, which is, yeah, but, you know, 30 years ago, there weren't many yoga teachers there, you know, we have a huge need for care professionals taking care of our seniors. Yes. Yes, but as you pointed out, those service jobs, those care professionals, those yoga teachers, those are not jobs that get compensated the way the software engineers do. And so I think we got to grapple with that. You know, you talk about care jobs. I was just looking at uh, BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics projections yesterday, and I knew care jobs were fast growing jobs. But I think what really struck me is that by 2031, BLS is predicting that home care home health and personal care aides will be the biggest job in the entire U.S. economy. And so those are jobs that pay poverty wages right now, done largely, almost almost entirely by women, where women, uh, women of color, immigrant women are overrepresented, um, really very uh, invisible and um, really unvalued jobs. So if this is going to become the job of the United States, does public policy have a role to play in making sure those jobs are better jobs? You know, I, 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 I'm almost certain that it does because you, you, you outlined the problem perfectly. You know, uh, taking care of a senior, hard to imagine, a, you know, an artificial intelligence, a robot doing that in a meaningful way. Yay, that's a secure job. But as you point out, it's also a poverty wage job. So um, you know, how do you alter that? Uh, there are analogs to this, right? You know, we all run around saying, you know, our public school teachers are the most important, uh, uh, you know, job that we have. They teach the next generation, they teach civics, and then we pay them very, very poorly. So you do have these market breaks where we all acknowledge that they're enormously valuable uh, positions, but for some reason, the market doesn't compensate them uh, as such. And I do think that there is, you know, even minimum wage, right? My friends on the right object to a minimum wage, and they've got some reasonable objections, right? If you, if you do raise the minimum wage to $15, as we would like to do nationally, that actually does have much more of an effect in a low wage geography, um, you know, in rural Alabama, that has a much more disruptive effect than it does in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So it's fair to grapple with these things, but there's just not a lot of history to suggest that if we're moving into a world of, as you pointed out, huge numbers of senior caregivers, we either need to be comfortable with the notion that more and more people will be living with poverty wages or we'll need to intervene in the market. And I obviously would prefer to see this, this, the second scenario done in, in an intelligent and thoughtful way. You know, it's, it's interesting when you look at, uh, you know, the role that public policy or government could play and you look at history, um, there's no doubt there's been really interesting research about how um, U.S. investment, you know, federal investment in innovation, uh, you know, can lead to not only greater innovation, technical, technological innovation, thinking, you know, semiconductors, the internet, uh, you know, auto, self-driving vehicles, the list goes on. And there's potential then for that kind of investment to drive better jobs. So is that another avenue that you can see uh, the federal government, the pu- public policy world playing? Well, it's, a, it's, it's unquestionable that investing more in research and development at the federal level is a very smart thing to do. Um, it's up there with increasing immigration in terms of things that you can do quickly that have profound and rapid economic effects. Um, 
And, you, you know, uh, I sometimes wave my iPhone around to tell that story, right? Because the iPhone, in some ways, it's, it's, it's the illustration of the perfect economic partnership. You know, lots of uh, private companies, Apple and all sorts of semiconductor companies, et cetera, et cetera, make a lot of money on that technology. But all of the stuff inside that, whether it's the GPS satellites or the early investments in semiconductors or voice recognition, we have that stuff because the federal government invested through programs like DARPA in that basic research that the private sector was not going to do. But again, that takes me back to the worry. You know, uh, it, it, let's just imagine that more federal research leads to an even better, you know, nine dimensional iPhone, whatever. You know, I still do worry um, that, that as we advance technologically, techno technology will at a rate much faster than ever in history squeeze out the economic value of human beings. So I do worry about that. And I do think. You know, UBI, universal basic income, it feels very futuristic and everything else. And I think it is. And people aren't quite ready to grapple with it in a meaningful way. But, you know, you do have to acknowledge that if, if we do arrive at a world where, you know, software can do most of the functions of a human being so much better than a human being and therefore in an economically more productive way, and this creates vast wealth. Um, you do need to grapple with the necessity for redistribution. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're going to end up with the masters and overlords of, you know, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, you know, capturing all that wealth and everybody else being left behind. Yeah, what it sounds very uh, War of the Worlds or uh, what am I thinking <laughs> of Time Machine, the, one of those futuristic uh, novels. Uh, you know, one of the other things that you talk about, and, and it sort of like builds on that point, is if we do have this future where there's less work to go around, you know, what then you talk about universal basic income or a safety net. I think in the podcast, you said people deserve something, uh, something that looks better than so something out of Dickens, which is sort of what we've got right now. Um, what role does, does public policy and sort of shoring up the safety net, you know, actually redesigning some of these really antiquated um, public policies around say unemployment and, and that whole system, what, what role does that play? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you don't even need to get to universal basic income, which, again, is a conversation that most people are not quite ready for yet to say that, look, in a society that is producing immense and inconceivable wealth, um, you ought to have a minimum baseline, right? Nobody ever, you know, nobody should be going hungry. Nobody shouldn't have access to health care, right? So, so that's what you, of course, referred to as a safety net, right? And there ought to, even though there is a left-right fight about this, there ought to be an acknowledgement that, you know, in the context of immense wealth, we ought to set a minimum below which no, no person will fall, um, that's more complicated, sadly, than it, than, it, than it should be. But then you raise sort of an interesting philosophical question. You know, if we do move into a world, and I'm not sure I'm buying into this sort of dystopian vision of millions of Americans who are being supported but have no, you know, economically constructive role in our society. I, I'm skeptical of that. But I'm also a little torn by that, right? Because on the one hand, you know, the futurists tell you, well, imagine a society where tens of millions of Americans have their material needs, needs met and they're, you know, investing in, in an understanding of, of, of poetry and literature and music and living these incredible lives. Yeah, maybe. But the flip side of that is or maybe you're just, you know, sc doom scrolling through Facebook and being <laughs> manipulated by algorithms. So. I used to be more of an optimist until I, you know, until the last four or five years about what humans left to their, you know, to, to themselves will, will do. Um, but, but, but that's more philosophical. Obviously, we need to get to a place in an enormously wealthy society where we just look at each other and say, look, let's argue about how we do it. But let's agree that there are going to be minimum standards of calories and access to health care and access to education that nobody will fall below. Mm. Well, I think that's a great place to end. So, uh, uh, Con Congressman Jim Himes, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is the first of many, many conversations uh, over, the, over the coming years. But thank you so much for being with us at the start. Thank you, Bridget. Really appreciate it. At this point, I'd love to in, uh, welcome our panel, uh, where we're going to be continuing on with these themes. Um, and I was just going to mention... Um, uh, the congressman mentioned uh, Michael Sandel, What Money Can't Buy. It's a, it's a, it's a really wonderful book about the limits of markets uh, and sort of what we decide is, uh, should belong in the market and what should be more of a public uh, and common good that leads to a good life. So it's a great book. I would suggest anybody read it.
But let me introduce our panel. Um, uh, and we've been really guided in this conversation by, again, those two questions, the vision, the imagination, the bold vision for what, what the future could look like, should look like, and then the action. How do we get there and who should do it? And so let me introduce our panelists. We're delighted to have Danielle Will Williams. She's a home care worker in Arkansas. Her daughter, Brittany Williams, who is a home care worker and a union member uh, with SEIU 775 in Washington State. We have Francisco Diaz. He's the senior policy strat strategist with the Center for Popular Democracy. We also have Sarah Kayla. She's the executive director of the Good Jobs Institute and Warren Valdmanis, he's a partner of Two Sigma Impact and he's the author of Accountable, How We Can Save Capitalism. So welcome all to the panelists. Molly and I are delighted to have you here, looking forward to this conversation. And I'd love to jump in with uh, Brittany and Danielle. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, you two, uh, but here, here we've got this um, BLS data that not only are home care and personal care jobs the fastest among the fastest growing of all jobs, but in a you know less than a decade, they're projected to be the biggest job in the United States. And you know, let me turn it over to the two of you. What will it take? You know, what will it take for those workers to be able to enjoy a future of work and well-being? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, it's going to take having a. Um, a workforce where our pay and our benefits is able to compete with other marketplaces. Um, it's gonna take developing a pipeline that's bringing high school workers straight into the field of caregiving and, and showing them that this is a career, not just a job. It is something that you can build off, move up the ladder in, support yourself and your family have a fulfilling retirement, um, fulfilling health care benefits, dental benefits, vision benefits, understanding that we are the baseline for our nation and what that looks like. Hi. Yeah, Danielle, what do you, what, what do you think? Just, just to piggyback on Brittany, you know, <laughs> Being in two different states, from Washington to Arkansas, the the caregiving status is is very different. Where you have union up in the northwest and down south, deep down south you don't. So you you consider as just another employer. But as you were saying as years to come, caregiving will be the most highest uh, job and we should get paid more because you can't bring machines and take care of somebody's mother, father, aunt, the brother. You, they can't replace us. We can't be replaced. We are, we are here and we're here to stay regardless of how much we make, what our job is, even with doctors, you can replace them. You can replace nurses, but you can't replace caregivers. Caregivers are always here. And you really can't pay a person enough to do what they do for as caregiving. I believe that if we, if we had unions to represent down south, we could get the benefits, we could get the retirement. And, and everything that comes with that package is vacation time. It wouldn't be where you're just going in to get a paycheck. It, it would be where you actually going in, you're liking your job because you're there and you're getting all the benefits that comes with that particular job, taking care of someone. Let me turn it over to Molly. Well, Brittany and Danielle, I'm so happy to see you both. Happy to see the whole panel. But uh, Brittany and Danielle, we've had the opportunity to meet. And I, I think I mentioned that, um, you know, really grateful daughter of someone who had in-home care uh, for the last years of his life and was able to live the end of his life the way he wished. Um, I am a big fan and great admirer of people who provide home care. And you mentioned, Danielle, the difference in being between being in Arkansas versus Washington. Well, I grew up in West Virginia, a rapidly aging population, uh, lots of history of labor organizing, but it hasn't quite made its way to benefit the home care workers yet. And so I'm curious, 
when you think about being in a different state, has either of you ever wanted to move someplace where you heard it was like easier or better to be a home care worker? Or, you know, is the pull of the relationships you have with the folks you care for just too strong? I don't <laughs> Mine wouldn't be to live somewhere where it'd be easier because I feel like being a caregiver and being one since 2010 is never easy. I, I, uh, I, lived in, I lived in Washington State for 12 years and then I came back here in 2018 to Arkansas. So it's the same, it's the same work for state. It's more pay in Washington State. Less play, less pay in Arkansas because you're doing the wages, it's the minimum of the wages. But if the people, excuse me, who have home care and caregivers like me, but still have credentials for a CNA to get higher pay, you would have to go into a nursing home or a hospital, but you're still doing the same scope of practice as if you would. As a caregiver, you're still doing the same job, just a different title. I'll put it that way, just a different title. So it's not easy. It's nowhere being easy going from one state to another state because you're still doing the same job. You just have different clients who have different disabilities and the wages are different. And so I will stand in agreement with that because um, what you have to look at when you're going from state to state, you have to look at the cost of living. So that varies from all the way from Hawaii to Alaska. The, um, we're seeing that that's not taken into consideration when people are, are the businesses or agencies or state are establishing the pay rates. They're not taking in consideration that we're dealing with inflation that's historical. We're dealing with the cost of gas continuing to increase. And these caregivers are required to show up at the people's houses. They're required to get there, whether they're using their own vehicle like myself or, or transit like I used to. We still have to continue to do that, provide that service. And so as my mom was saying, it varies from state to state. It's the same work, but it needs to match the cost of living. So, as a Washingtonian, I'm very blessed because I am in one of the best states to be a caregiver in right now. I have had the opportunity in the past month to talk to caregivers out of Alaska where they actually saw a pay cut. And now they're fighting for that increase to get back to where they should be and beyond that. So. I would say, yes, being on the West Coast does make a difference as a caregiver. You do get to get more benefits. You do have that voice of the union, 45,000 plus caregivers. In our union, we represent not just Washington State, but Montana as well. So I do have that backing support, which is not seen in every state. So, you know, there's a lot of factors that weigh on that. Thank you so much, Brittany and Danielle. As Molly said, it's just delightful to have both of you here and part of the conversation. Um, I'd love to bring in Sarah at this point. Sarah, you're with the Good Jobs Institute and you have also um, co-authored a paper that has really kind of looks at uh, what some people call quote unquote low skill work um, and that has been traditionally devalued, um, care work being considered part of that. I'd love for you to talk about uh, kind of where that perception came from, how it impacts the market and, and what we need to be thinking about as we move to a, to a more equitable future. Thanks, Bridget. And Brittany and Danielle, thank you for being on. Um, it's so incredibly important to have you here. Um, and I, and I want to start um, with you and with, with direct care work. Um, there's a lot of talk about upskilling. And I think when you hear that, we're putting a lot of the onus on individuals. You don't have the skills. You need to get better skills, not the entire job market. And that's really not what we're facing right now. So there are a lot of bad jobs in the United States. 2019, about a third of workers were in jobs that did not pay a living wage. That's 53 million people. These are 
bad jobs for people and they're not going away. And I'm so glad that the BLS stats on um, healthcare and home uh, direct care workers have already come up. Um, we hear a lot about, oh, you need to be upskilled to the, the fastest growing occupations. The fastest growing occupation is actually a wind turbine tech and it's 61% it's gonna grow um, according to BLS, but there's only 7,000 of them right now. So we're gonna add 4,300 jobs it's home health care, direct care workers who have the largest number of jobs who are going to be added. And it's incredibly important for our society. So I think there's just such a disconnect between what fast is growing and what the actual number of jobs are that are out there. So like, let's look at data in a different way and let's do some real math. We need great um, home health care workers. We need restaurant workers. We need all sorts of workers who right now we can't find in our economy. And it's making it really hard. Um, so, you know, A, there's a lot of bad jobs that are not going anywhere. Um, the jobs that are out there that are low skilled by, by terminology are really important jobs. These are essential jobs, right? So most of the essential jobs labeled during COVID, they are also labeled by many low skill. Um, and we just have to get beyond that. Um, these are already skilled jobs. And that's again, Brittany and Danielle, I'm gonna tell you what you do, but I'd love for you, for you to sort of expand on the kind of work you do. Home healthcare, we, we've done work in, in senior care. And when you're a certified nursing assistant, you are getting people out of bed, you're helping them get dressed. And while you do that, you're looking to see uh, about their skin health and making sure that they're, you know, that they're eating properly and making sure that they're um, either gaining or losing weight, whatever they're supposed to be doing. You're checking on their bowel movements, which is incredibly important and might mean you need to sort of move around medications. You are the first line of medical defense and you are deeply caring for people in a way that I, I can't even fathom doing. So you are, you know, people's favorite shirt and their favorite way to do their hair and you know, and you get them ready to see their families in a way that is dignified. You are doing something that I can't even imagine doing. And someone somewhere has decided that it's low skilled. And why? Because it's done by women and it's done by women of color and it's done by immigrants and it's done by people who don't speak English as a first language. And that's really what our paper looked at. Um, Zainab Tan, Amanda Silver and I wrote uh, an MIT teaching note on this. Um, and you know, we found that you know a typist would be considered less low skilled than a um, a type machine setter. This is again in the sort of 70s and 80s. We don't really have those jobs anymore. Um, but very interestingly, a nurse and a nursery school teacher, those jobs were rated as having less complexity than a dog pound attendant. There, that is not coming from any kind of reality except for racism and um, and misogyny. And so we really have to get over that. Just wanted to to sort of add all of that in. I'm going to stop here, but. Um, let us never use the term low skill again. When you're doing that, you are, um, you're, you're, you're making, you're, you're not dignifying the deep amount of skill that every American worker brings to their job. I absolutely love that. Yeah, the, 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 let's agree to banish the word low skill. Um, you know, but speaking, Francisco, if we could turn to you at this point, you've worked with an awful lot of workers, um, essential workers in particular. And, and before COVID certainly, but during COVID as well. And I'm wondering if you can, if you can kind of uh, talk about sort of the advocate and the worker role in uh, trying to create fairer systems moving forward. Absolutely. And I think these are kind of, um, uh, in order to kind of create fairer systems, I think we need to be first and foremost working with and alongside and in solidarity with workers who are in these essential roles, right? Without um, without home care workers, so much of our entire medical system would fall apart. So much of our economy and our society would have fallen apart without essential workers who were very much kind of the base of the CPD's network, Center for Popular Democracy is a national network of community organizations. We have worker centers, unions, and, um, and other community-based groups that really work with uh, communities of color around the country. And so, you know, really kind of first and foremost, kind of fighting and organizing alongside a lot of workers who are just trying to improve their workplaces and find uh, ways to build dignity at work, you know, whether that's uh, to have more benefits, to avoid wage theft, um, you know, and whether you're a dollar store worker in Alexandria, Louisiana, or um, Starbucks workers in Hartford, you know, we are, we're trying to um, support that. But the other thing too, is to help them. And I'm thinking very much from you know, an advocate side who is on the worker side often in these discussions to win demands that improve both improve the material conditions of workers in their workplaces. So we try and do that through stable scheduling or through um, 
or through greater accountability in the workplaces by having in better enforcement mechanisms, but also something uh, we try and win demands together with them that make it easier for workers to have a real say in their workplace and to make it easier to win future improvements in their workplace. And obviously these improvements are not always gonna be in conflict with employers, but it is something that you know we are often trying to think through. So by doing these kind of two steps of both organizing first and foremost alongside workers um, to find what are the problems, to address those problems, to and then to win demands that both make things immediately better and make it easier to organize um, and bring people together and to have a real say, um, I think we can build that kind of transformative change uh, that is necessary, really fundamentally necessary, I think, to reorient and avoid the Blade Runner future, because that's actively what I think we 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 are potentially facing if we don't have um, more value. And I think you know we really see a difference in between Washington and Arkansas, for example, just as a, an immediate example, where workers in in Washington have a little bit more say, a lot more say because they are in solidarity with their fellow home care workers um, through a union and, you know, have allies like Work in Washington, which is an affiliate of ours, you know, who work closely together with the local, you know, and I think that's kind of a key distinction to think about, about on the advocate side, how do we bring these different steps together um, to move things, to move, you know, the economy forward and really change the labor market in the United States. We've we've heard a lot about kind of the, the importance of networks and grassroots organizing and um, things that I think all of us associate with making great change in this country. Now, Warren, <laughs> obviously business has driven a lot of change in this country too, but we often see business and investment sectors as kind of independent actors. They can kind of do what they want, play by their own rules, and they have a tremendous amount of influence. You've done quite a bit of writing and speaking about how uh, as an impact investor and as a, a business innovator, you see a way um, to, to making positive social change for workers. I'd love to hear more about that, especially based on what you've heard from your fellow panelists so far. Yeah, well, first, let me just say um, I'm deeply um, sympathetic and, 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 and agree with many of the remarks that have been made already. You know, I'm the son of a, um, of a social worker who got paid almost nothing uh, working with old people, and I'm the husband of a, of a preschool teacher. Um, so I've seen uh, up close um, how hard those jobs are uh, and how disproportionate the uh, the pay is uh, to the value. Um, uh, but um, my you know my role in in, in this sort of conversation, I I, I sort of uh, I'm a believer that business can be a force for good. Um, it can't solve everything, um, but if business business doesn't solve some things, then we're in a lot of trouble because just to give you a sense of proportion, you know, philanthropy in the United States has been pretty consistently at about 2% of GDP for a long time, you know, many decades. Um, you know, the you know, business contributes something like 90% of economic output. And if we don't harness that to some degree, um, I think many problems, especially problems as big as this one, are going to be hard to solve. <clears throat> so, um, I, you know, I um, helped start a business called Two Sigma Impact. We're an investment business that uh, it, it aims to invest in good employers and to foster um, uh, good employment practices with the idea, you know, the, the, the sort of simple tagline is, you know, good jobs equals better companies. Um, and, um, and that's not just something I believe, that's something we've done a ton of research around. So um, we've spent much of the past uh, few years trying to figure out um, what exactly that statement means. So what is a good job and how does it foster um, better, uh, better companies? You know, we came to the view that um, you know, a good job is one that has uh, four factors. The first is uh, fair treatment, so um, uh, you know, living wages and things like that, benefits and scheduling flexibility. Um, the second thing is um, promising future, so some ability to uh, you know, in, you know, grow with a, 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 with, uh, over time uh, in your role and, in, and at, your, at your company. Uh, the third is psychological safety or attuned leadership, this idea that you're kind of connected in some way to your company in, in a way that you, you can actually speak your mind and, um, and also get feedback uh, from, from the people that you work with. And then finally, a sense of purpose. And uh, what greater purpose than what Danielle and Brittany do, you know, help, helping uh, the elderly? Um, you know, when, when, when a company truly embraces uh, its purpose, it often finds that it can, um, uh, you know, it often finds that it, it has more um, energized and satisfied applied workers. Now, these uh, factors are important socially, but they're also important business um, issues because uh, today, north of 50% of workers in the United States describe themselves as disengaged. But something like one in seven or eight workers um, is so disenchanted by 
how they're treated on the job, they actively work against the interests of their employers. So, you know, one in eight workers in America. And, and that's, that is a, a big economic drag. We have found conversely that when you do invest in companies and, and, and try to foster um, you know, good jobs and better employment practices, um, you often have much better companies, much more valuable companies. You do have to make an investment in the first instance. So you do have to make some, somewhat of a leap of faith. Um, but when you make that leap of faith, uh, I have found that it pays off. Um, the most successful investments I've made in my career um, have been ones where the organization was truly a great organization and where its, it's workers, particularly its workers uh, you know, closest to its uh, customers or patients, are truly engaged and energized. Uh, and by the way, I've worked um, uh, with, with Sarah uh, looking at a restaurant company, looking at some other companies, uh, and, and trying to figure out where is this overlap between what's socially, um, so, you know, socially interesting, but also economically interesting. And there is a bigger overlap than most investors assume. Certainly, um, many people in my industry of private equity, um, I think, have a bit of a blind spot for, uh, for this. Well, I'd love to, to go back to Sarah at that point. Um, Sarah, can you talk about that? What does the research show that when you treat workers well and you invest in workers, it's actually better for business? Yeah, so to start, there is great research that shows this. And there's also research that shows you can offer really bad jobs and make a lot of money. You can offer really good jobs and make a lot of money. So my colleague Zainab um, Tan and one of her colleagues from MIT came out with a paper that showed that there are those two sort of points so we, we need to have a lot of pressure to sort of change the narrative of what it means to run a good business, but you absolutely can make great money, really satisfy your customers um, and offer great jobs. Um, so that's that's been the bulk of Zainab's um, work. She wrote The Good Job Strategy, which I've subtly placed right here on my bookshelf. Um, and, and she has studied a, a set of retailers, mainly low margin retailers. Um, so grocery, um, convenience store chains, look at that, not even a plant. Um, who you know are able to offer outsized fantastic jobs um, for their workers? So this is a Costco who you know starts in retail at seventeen dollars an hour, but the average wage is twenty five, and, and you get there fairly quickly. So you get to a living wage that way. Um, to Quick Trip, which is a gas station convenience store in the Midwest, uh, we just visited one in Dallas, and their starting wage for a full time night assistant is fifty five thousand dollars a year um, in retail, which again is sort of outsized, um, and they have outsized customer satisfaction and um, um, you know, if you if you follow Costco on the stock market, they've done really well. Um, and the key to them is they understand that turnover and, and team instability is not good for their customer, and that's not going to be how they win with their customer. We've worked with more than 20 companies over the past five years who've been implementing the good job strategy. And I don't know why I'm still shocked every time. Many of them have not even calculated the direct cost of turnover. So what does it cost to hire, train, and get someone to base productivity? Um, this can be a couple of thousand dollars in the service sector. This can be up to $40,000 with one call center that we worked with because they've got licensing fees and really intensive training. If it costs you $40,000 to replace somebody, you best hold on to them and you best do that in a way um, that, that really um, supports them. And at the same time, those couple of thousand of dollars to, to, to replace a worker, that in no way is the real cost. So you've got the direct cost of turnover. Then you've got the indirect cost of turnover which can be really big. What are all the costs that you're incurring because you've got high turnover? Safety costs, waste costs, shrink costs. What are all the lost revenue that you, you, you are not capturing because you're not serving your customers well? Um, and finally, uh, something that, that very, very few companies have thought about is what is the competitive cost? And this is huge. What are you not able to do over time um, because you have high turnover, because you have a lot of staff instability? Um, so we really encourage companies to be thinking about every one of those steps. Um, and, and going back to, to home health care as well, like there's real human costs in all of this too. Um, the turnover cost um, is huge in home health care. During COVID, um, so many uh, nursing homes were shut down to family, but workers were still coming in and out. And they were literally coming in and out because we don't pay nursing home workers enough. They would often have to have two or three jobs. And so they're bringing COVID to multiple places with them. And there's research that shows that we would have had um, about 44% less um, either cases or morbidity, um, if, if home healthcare workers had one good job that they could do instead of being forced to have multiple jobs. So the costs here are to your employees, it is to the sustainability of your business, and it is to our society very strongly. You know, what you're saying, Brittany, it reminds me so much of what you and Danielle talk about, um, you know, that 
and I'd love for the two of you to reflect on that, that when you have a good job, when you, you know, in, in this, this case, care or home care workers, when that is a good job and the turnover, you know, is low, uh, the quality of care gets better and people are able to stay in their homes. And then in Washington state, we had another podcast that you were on where the state was really thrilled with that idea because then people were able to stay in their homes and not go to more expensive nursing home care. So people were happier. That cost the state less money that when you had a good job, you know, it, there were just so many, um, uh, so many cascading positive benefits to people and businesses and society. I'd love for the two of you to reflect on that a little bit more. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly as you said, it's, it's that ripple effect. I always like to take it back to the ripple effect. When you have those amazing caregivers doing their job, happy, they're fulfilled, they're able to keep the family of those clients employed and they're able to go to work, they're able to go to school, they're able to put that money that they're making back into our economy, especially right now. We really need to see that recycling of money back into our economy. We need to see where people aren't having to call into work because no one's there to take care of grandma or mom or dad or my child. Uh, we also know that, well, I know that from having conversations from caregivers and legislators to everyday people that some of those very important people that we call essential depend on caregivers because they have family. As, we, as we've seen from the statistics that have been presented to us today, people are living longer. And you're seeing, because of inflation, multi-generational homes. So they're depending very much on us and what we, what we supply as, as um, workers so that they can continue to work continue to be the doctors, continue to be the lawyers, the legislators, the teachers, the um, even our fast food workers. They're, continue, they're able to continue doing what we need them to do to keep our society moving. So it's a ripple effect. And whenever you mess up that ripple, it affects every other economic structure and business in some type of way. Um, small example, when our teachers went on strike, that was a whole community that had to figure out, oh no, what do I do with my children for a week? Because unfortunately, caregivers, fortunately and unfortunately, caregivers are one of the only careers, one of the, one of the fields that you cannot go on strike because that's abandonment. And a lot of our clients rely on us to stay alive. Just piggyback on what Brittany was saying. I was a, a daycare teacher for like 15 years. So basically, I look at it as I'm the same field, but I just went to the, as they would say, the older age, the baby stage when they went to <laughs> from one baby to the baby. That's how I look at it. That's, they're my babies, regardless of the age difference. And you know, we see here, we listen, I listened to uh, one of the speakers, I can't remember the name, where he was saying, um, we have benefits, but I look back where my biggest benefit would be like, you no know, health care and um, retirement is great, but you, where you have nurses and uh, the medical systems and all of them, they just get schooling. Why you can't, if you don't give us raises, why you can't benefit us with grants where we can continue our education to go up the ladder, but we still uh, putting back into being home care. We just, we actually just help, you just helping us to benefit more into nursing. I'm, where I'm trying to become an uh, RN, but I still can have the benefits of getting that education you you pushing that education on me you, you know you helping me to get to that point where knowing that i can do this because i have the because i take care of people that's what my heart is i take care of people regardless of what kind of illness they have and I, 
example of when I got out of child care, I was kind of tired of that career. So I went into to, uh, home care and not knowing what I was doing, but everything that I learned, I learned through my clients. Um, I have no clue of how to take care of somebody who had diabetes or uh, asthma or seizures. My clients taught me that. So being next to my client was like having my, being next to my parents, taking care of my parents. So I, I treat all of my clients as if they were blood relatives. They are relatives to me because I'm not, I don't do bias. I don't, I don't look at colors and I don't, you know, I don't look at if she's what female, male, however. I look at them as they need help and bringing them back into the home. It, it's great thing because if you put in the nursing home, it's abandoned. Regardless, if it, it's been not being abandoned, you really are because you still continue work. And they there with outside people that they don't know. And it's like leaving a baby on the doorstep. <laughs> You know, you can leave a child on the doorstep, you're abandoning a child. So if, like Brittany said, when pandemic hit, it was a lot of clients who lost their caregivers, but there was a lot of us who kept working because that was the way we paid our bills. We had to do that. We, we had to interact with maybe one or two clients, not knowing if they're going to catch COVID or, or, or if family member or someone in the home had COVID, we had to continue to work. So my my suggestion is for us, you know, representatives, just help us to further our education, push us a little bit more where, hey, yeah, come on, take this class, take this, take this class to help you further your, help you further your education as a home care. Because when I was in Washington State, I took a home care class where I was able to be a nurse dedicated and I took medical medical assistance. But when I came back to Arkansas, none of that applied to this state. So I was just considered a home care worker, even though my credentials for CNA was transferred, was here, but none of the other credentials that I had uh, took earlier, did none of them apply to the state of Arkansas. We've spent a good amount of time, importantly so, oh. talking about providing care and uh, who cares for our elders, our children, um, and what care does to keep the economy moving. So I have a question, just kind of go around the horn. Francisco, I'm going to put you on the spot first. And that is, how do we provide space for workers to care for themselves? We know that whether people have underpaid punishing hours um, whether they have a, a, a lower paid job or higher paid job that work stress is something that kind of unites us all. It's taking a major toll. So tell us what you see as a role for your organization or for other organizations or institutions to create space for workers to take care of their mental and emotional and physical health. Oh my gosh. Um, I say this maybe as a union member because I, it's a really hard thing not to say this because I think that it's really like we have to, if in the in the in the realm of organizing, just generally working with workers is always about respecting boundaries, be practicing those boundaries that they don't always feel or experience at work. But at the same time, there's we've talked about how structural this problem is, how pervasive it is, how much business has to, you know, on the broader scale, change in order to in order to actually create those spaces for care. And I really think that there is rarely such a a powerful self care kind of manual other than workers coming together to express themselves and be able to assert their needs and be able to try and meet those needs. And I really think that, you know, when we think about this on the society wide level, being able to have those honest negotiations is going to help undo a lot of the bad trends we've been seeing over the last 50 years. And that's my brief answer to that question, because I think it's a very complicated one. And it's a hard one that, you know, is constantly contested, constantly negotiated, that we each negotiate each day as workers. I think everyone here does it to some extent, you know, talking and um, and figuring out in our own experiences, but I'll, I'll end it there and let others go. Thank you, Francisco. Sarah, what do you think? How do we create space for workers to care for themselves? 
Yeah, I would I would say um, we have an employee pyramid that talks about what makes up a good job and it's meeting basic needs of pay and benefits and stable schedules and career growth and safety and security. And then it's also meeting higher needs around belonging and achievement and recognition and, and personal growth and meaning. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'm going to answer from the company point of view. I think companies really have to have better data um, on what their their employees are experiencing so that they can create that space for them. So if you're an employer and you haven't done a living wage assessment, if you're an employer and you don't know the average number of, you don't have a histogram of hours worked um, by your team so you understand, are we providing enough hours for people to really be able to make ends meet? If you don't know how many people are actually taking you up on your benefits. We worked with one company that had healthcare, but only 4% of their frontline workers were taking them up on it because it was too expensive of this, this is a different company, but this happens a lot in healthcare, right? In senior living companies, um, home health aides cannot afford the health insurance offered by their employer, like just work on that, right? Like, so they're, they're getting health insurance is often through, um, you know, here in Massachusetts through sort of different health connectors, but really understand the financial precarity of your workforce. If you're not helping make sure that people can meet their basic needs, there is not going to be very much space. Um, and in fact, that kind of financial precarity adds a ton of stress um, to people's lives. And there's fantastic research by Carrie Liana at University of, of Pittsburgh that, you know, truck drivers who are under financial stress have more accidents, that nurses who are under financial stress don't have as much empathy. And empathy is so incredibly important to caregiving. So um, companies, I would just do the call out, find out the the financial, um, how your workers are doing financially and, and really try to figure out how to improve it. Thank you, Sarah. Warren, I'll come to you. Well, maybe I'll just build a little bit on what Sarah said, and this is a this is a tricky, and this is definitely a tricky question. I mean, Sarah said, find out how your fam, how your uh, workers are doing financially, and 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 certainly that's important. Um, but I think um, that's part of a larger thing, which is kind of listening to your employees and having structural ways of listening to your employees. Um, because I, I, you know, in my experience, and, and I deal mostly with sort of medium sized companies, so um, it's certainly possible that larger companies are generally better at this. But most medium sized companies. They may or may not have a head of HR. Um, if they do, they almost certainly don't have any real structural way of getting you know, sort of hearing from the front lines. And many of these companies, they started as smaller companies where the leader cared and could hear what was going on, but they've grown into bigger companies and it's just much harder for that leader to understand what's actually happening. So we, we um, not only try to look at some of the data that Sarah mentioned. So for example, I'm trying to understand um, you know, living wages and, 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 and where, where, where folks don't have them. But we also, um, at all of our companies, um, have structural you know, voice of worker feedback um, loops. And, and sometimes you hear things that are surprising. Um, by the way, as an investor, sometimes you hear things that are um, that are really scary and lead lead us, you know, lead us to take action in terms of you know we don't have the right leaders in this company, we don't have the right you know whatever it might be. Um, but uh, but but I, I in my experience um, as an investor. Uh, I've, I've seen um, the blind spots that come from just not having a pulse of what's going on, and uh, you know, with, with your workers. And I've seen what it's like when you do, and it's just a, it's just a lot more. It's a lot easier um, to address employee needs if you actually truly understand them. Thank you, Warren. Danielle, I'm going to come to you next. Where where do you go to take care of yourself at work? Do you have a space? Is there a structure? What should be there? Maybe while Danielle's coming back on, Brittany, I'll go to you. Same question. Okay, so I'm gonna answer this. So I'm gonna answer this question from the point of not just a caregiver, but I also sit on the executive board for my union, and I also have the opportunity. Um, I am blessed to be able to be a trustee on our health benefit trust, and so I get to see it from three different aspects. And so I, I, um, I love what Warren has been talking about and Sarah, you know, and, and Francisco. So our union um, under our health benefit trust, we have actually used and implemented apps. One of them is called the ginger app. I always talk about the ginger app because caregiving nurses, you know, sometimes home nurses, we don't get that, that coworker interaction. So we use these apps, these different tools, and this would be a great tool for smaller companies as well, where the, the, care can, the caregiver can go on the app and talk to a counselor or uh, use calming tools to just release the stress of the day. 
one of my favorite common tools, I have a deck of cards and you pull a card out. My favorite card is clean up one room in the house. That room, no one is allowed to go in. That is your, your, your quiet place, your Zen room, your happy room. And that room always stays clean. That's just the place where you detox. So seeing more uh, use of different apps and tools that are out there available, not even very expensive tools, something that's just that simple for um, the caregivers to be able to pull from. Uh, as an executive board, we do a lot of um, polls and we do a lot of um, emails where we're having that communication line completely open where we do have a lot of smaller meetings. We call them turf breakout meetings where we're making sure that we at least once a month is hearing that input from the caregivers directly. How are you guys doing? How is this looking for you? How is your stress level? Is this main, is this at a level where you can maintain paying your health benefits or is that too much? Offering that that uh, communication line, making sure that it's always open. Even if we don't agree all the time politically, you want to keep that line of communication open. Um, you want to also make sure that you have that, we have that uh, different resources with our MRC where caregivers can call in and they can get that needed help outside of just making sure they have an advocate for if anything just happens on the job place. Do you happen to know? You know, like uh, Francisco said, we're partnered with other nonprofits. So if we have like people that are dealing with immigration issues, caregivers, because a lot of our caregivers are immigrants, BIPOC, we can we can uh, pull on our non one of our another um, sister or brother locals or um, organizations like One America and be like, hey, they need help with this. Can you help them out? Just having those different um connections. It's all about keeping the connections and having that open communication and having tools, being able to use those different tools. It, it, it helps lift the, lo the load. It makes the environment lighter, especially when you're isolated. And I just appreciate, I appreciate what I'm hearing today on this panel. I just wanted to say that too. Well, Danielle, well, have you back? Yeah. Hi. I don't have. Yeah. I really don't have nowhere to express myself. I'm just like learning. I just do it on my own because I work seven days a week. So when I feel like I'm kind of overwhelmed a little bit, I kind of get to myself. But yeah, I don't like when I was in Seattle, I was, on a, I was a mentor. I had somebody to talk to. I had the other caregivers. Here, I don't have other caregivers to talk to. So it's just me and my clients, and, and I take care of my son. So yeah, I take care of a lot of family members. So I, don't, so I have to deal with stress a whole different level. I don't have any or anything like that. Or other people to go and, you know, just sit down, have coffee with, or just just to vent to, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Danielle. Before I hand back to Bridget uh, to mm -hmm. wrap us up, I do want to say thanks to folks uh, in the audience who submitted some interesting comments and some questions about some more global kind of statistical questions about how the U.S. stacks up against some other countries. I would encourage you to go to newamerica.org and go to the Better Life Lab program and the New Practice Lab program and take a look at statistics on care, paid leave, child care in America. There's lots of information on our website. Um, and we did have one trailing question that I don't think we'll get to today, but we do see you, Anthony, asking about quiet quitting. Sounds like a topic for another event and a really good conversation. But uh, Bridget, I'll hand back to you. Well, thank you so much, Molly. Thank you so much to our panelists. We are so grateful to, to have you all here. We're grateful to the people who um, have uh, joined us virtually. So Warren, Francisco, Sarah, Brittany, Danielle, thank you so much. Um, we'd also like to thank all of the people, Angela, Jason, Riley, uh, all the others at New America who have helped uh, put this together. Um, thanks to the entire team working on the podcast, the convening, and now the road, roadmap paper in this. 
uh, very grateful to have um, so many so many people who participated um, in the podcast, both on on air and off. And we're very grateful to our uh, partners at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and to Paul Torini, who's been a wonderful partner in this as well. So thank you all. Uh, and may we all continue the conversation as we work toward a better future of work, care, and well-being. Thank you so much. <laughs>